Hello, my name is Nick Brandmeier. I'm here to talk about our early experience at West Virginia University using the Iroflow irrigating catheter uh, and how it has helped us care for our patients in the neurointensive care unit. In this talk, I'm going to be going over why I think we need a better EVD, what the Iroflow device is, how it works, and why I think it is a better EVD, how I use it in my practice in the intensive care unit, and what are some of the important outcomes that I expect and that I think you can expect by using Iroflow in your practice. So before talking about something new or a new therapy, it's important to discuss what is the state of the art, where are we now, and why do we need to improve it? Why isn't it good enough? So what are the in-hospital outcomes for the neurocritical care unit? So our in-hospital death rate in the neurocritical care unit is around 13%, which is very high. The need for trachs and pegs in our uh, admitted patients is 20%, which is double the rate that you'd expect to see in a surgical ICU or a medical ICU. Length of stay is 13 days for the ICU, which is three times the rate of patients admitted to the surgical ICU or other ICUs. But patients treated in the neurocritical care unit for a neurologic illness have half of the mortality risk that patients treated in general ICUs do. And the most common diagnoses that we treat in the neurocritical care unit would be subarachnoid hemorrhage, intracerebral hemorrhage, traumatic brain injury, ischemic stroke, and subdural hematoma. So importantly, um, patients treated in the neurocritical care unit, as I said, have their mortality risk decreased by half. And the diagnoses are, are these common diagnoses here. And so what lessons can we draw from those facts? And so I would use that to drive the hypothesis that specialized knowledge and techniques can improve patient outcomes in the neurocritical care unit. And improvement in outcomes in the neurocritical care unit can be driven by focusing on improvements in the most common conditions treated in the NCCU. So what are the problems with our current techniques? Number one, EVDs have a high complication rate. Infection ranges from 4 to 20 percent based on a variety of factors and probably random error in sampling across the literature. Uh, infection risk increases with occlusion. And the current antibiotic impregnated catheters have uh, limitations on their effectiveness, primarily focused on gram-positive infections, and come with increased costs. Um, revision rates of external ventricular catheters are around 13 percent, and most of that is related to occlusion. And occlusion occurs in 25 to 50 percent of patients with an intraventricular hemorrhage. And then there's EVD-associated hemorrhage risk. Based on that, I would argue that if we could reliably decrease our rates of EVD infection, occlusion, hemorrhage, and revision, we could improve outcomes in the patients we treat in the neurocritical care unit. So looking at the common diagnoses we talked about earlier, um, we can focus first on chronic subdural hematoma, which is a common reason for admission to the intensive care unit. Recurrence after surgical treatment is as high as 18%. And acute subdural hematomas may transform into chronic subdural hematomas, and those will have a higher morbidity than the spontaneous chronic subdural hematomas that we often see. Multiple surgical and medical avenues have been tried to prevent recurrence with modest success at best. And the only randomized controlled trial in this domain of drain placement after chronic subdural hematoma showed that uh, recurrence can be prevented by placement of a functioning drain. So based on that, um, improving postoperative drainage after acute and chronic subdural hematomas may improve our outcomes and prevent recurrence of this common disease. So if we focus our attention on other diagnoses that occur in the critical care unit, one of the ones that jumps out right away is subarachnoid hemorrhage. We know that calcium channel blockers can improve or ameliorate vasospasm and increase um, or improve long-term outcomes. However, because of the systemic side effects in emotopine, less than 50% of patients admitted with a ruptured aneurysm actually receive their full course. So if we had a topical or local way to administer that drug, we may be able to improve outcomes by increasing our ability to deliver the full course of therapy to patients. Further, ventric ventriculitis, which is often a spontaneous condition, has a high degree of mortality even with modern antibiotic treatment. That can be because of the blood-brain barrier preventing effective concentrations of uh, antibiotics in the CSF um, or multidrug resistant bacteria. Mortality for this condition hovers around 30 percent even with modern care as I said. Um, and so if we could improve antibiotic penetration to the ventricle, uh, we certainly should be able to move the needle on treating um, ventricular infections. And then finally when we look at intraventricular hematomas or hemorrhage, they often cause hydrocephalus, prolonged ICU stays, 
um, or permanent hydrocephalus requiring BP shunting. These are often thought of as kind of the bane of the neuro ICU because of their prolonged hospital stay and the difficulty getting current therapies to work consistently. The CLEAR-3 trial showed us that you can improve length of stay and clearing of IVH with the use of intraventricular TPA. However, intraventricular TPA use comes with a lot of downsides, such as the need to break open a sterile system, um, clamping the drain even in patients who have hydrocephalus, and others. So it's clear that if we had a way to improve outcomes and, and facilitate treatment across these domains, we should be able to improve the care and outcomes of our patient in the neurocritical care unit. So that leads me to my next hypothesis that direct injection or installation of medication into the ventricle um, or into the spinal fluid could allow for improved outcomes and less systemic toxicity across a wide variety of conditions, including those we just talked about, ruptured aneurysm or subarachnoid hemorrhage, intraventricular hemorrhage, and ventricular infection. So if we summarize the state of the art in our current knowledge, if we had a technique or a device that would lower the complication rate of external ventricular drains, reduce the recurrence of chronic subdural hematomas or the development of chronic subdural hematomas after acute subdural hematomas and allow the administration of intrathecal or intraventricular medication, it would be valuable and worthwhile investigating its use in the neurocritical care unit. So I'm focusing now on what is the Iroflow catheter and how does it work? So it's a dual lumen, as you can see pictured there, ventricular catheter that has the ability to continuously or semi-continuously irrigate fluid into the ventricle um, and drain at the same time, all in an ICP controlled way so that you can use the, the settings we're all familiar with, leveling height, drain above height, alarm settings, but at the same time, add the parameters of um, irrigation, either with saline or with saline and medication, and as well as the features of keeping the catheter patent and continuously irrigating to improve the longevity and safety rates of the drain. At WVU, we've been early adopters of the Iroflow system, and I use it aggressively and largely for any clinical scenario where an EVD would be used, I use the Iroflow. Um, based on our experience over the past couple of years, um, these are some basic tips that I think will improve success as you get started. I would suggest irrigating anywhere between 20 to 60 mLs per hour. Um, placement can be per facility routine. Here at WVU, we often will place all our ventricular drains with the bedside stealth machine, but if you place them using ultrasound or in the OR or standard anatomic techniques, all of that works fine. Drain height should be set as you normally would. For subdural hematomas, um, when you're using this as a subdural drain, I would recommend you set it as low as possible, which would be the equivalent of draining to gravity in a non-regulated uh, drain setting. And then arrange medication concentration so that the dose is appropriate regardless of the irrigation rate, so that whether you're at 20 to 60, the the 24 hour dose of medication would be appropriate and in parameters over here you can see some common medication dosages or concentrations that i've worked with my pharmacist to develop um, that will give you um, the appropriate dose no matter what probably the most common one that we're used to seeing would be altaplace or tpa where if you mix it two milligrams and 500 mls of normal saline any rate that you run it at between 20 and 60 will give you a clinically appropriate dose over 24 hours here I'm going to go over a few cases. This first one is a chronic subdural hematoma, which you can see on the right facing the sulci. This is a 63-year-old man with type 2 diabetes and morbid obesity, multiple falls. He was treated with a trephin craniotomy and placement of an ear flow drain uh, on the first hospital day. Here you can see our early post-op scan where the sulcal effacement has been completely relieved. The isodense component of the chronic subdural hematoma has been replaced by uh, hypodense cerebrospinal fluid and saline, and the shift and compression of the brain has been resolved. This patient was agitated postoperatively and ended up pulling his drain, and so this resolution of his subdural was accomplished within 12 hours post-op. This is another interesting case of a 48-year-old male uh, institutionalized because of his advanced Huntington's disease who presented to uh, several days of worsening mental status and severe left arm and left-sided weakness. On admission, he was minimally uh, verbal, and his left arm and left side was severely paretic. CT scan showed this very large uh, compressive chronic subdural hematoma. Similarly, he was brought to the operating room on hospital day one for a trephin craniotomy, an evacuation of the chronic subdural, and a placement of an ear flow drain. We irrigated this at 40 mLs per hour with sterile normal saline, 
and the drain was able to be removed on the evening of post-operative day one with near complete with complete resolution rather of the brain compression and near complete resolution of the chronic subdural hematoma with only the deep membrane uh, remaining. Here I'm going to show a series of intraventricular hemorrhage cases collected over a week. This first case was one of my partner's cases where the patient presented with a ruptured aneurysm and IVH and was treated with a standard external ventricular drain. You can see the pre-op images here and then on the merge study we'll swing to the post-operative images approximately hospital day three. You can see remaining third ventricular, lateral ventricle, and fourth ventricular blood clots that have largely stable in size despite the treatment of the hydrocephalus, which is what we'd all expect with EVD treatment of a ruptured aneurysm with severe IVH. Here's an admission from that same week where we look at a patient with a ruptured aneurysm and uh, IVH, very similar uh, scan appearance to the look, one we just looked at. Here you can see the preoperative scan. And then as we swirl the merge, you can see the fourth ventricle has been cleared of blood, the third ventricle has been cleared of blood, the lateral ventricles have been cleared of blood, and the hydrocephalus is resolved, all by post-bleed uh, day three. And then finally, we have a patient who had a hypertensive deep brain IPH with IVH, a standard basal ganglia hemorrhage, which you can see casting of the third, fourth lateral ventricles. Um, he received uh, iroflow placement and aggressive irrigation with TPA. And then here you can see on hospital day three, although some of the lateral ventricle blood remains, the third, the frontal horns, and the fourth ventricle are all completely cleared of hemorrhage and the hydrocephalus completely resolved. This is another interesting case where a patient had an IVH with significant amount of temporal clot. An iroflow was placed, we irrigated with ITTPA anywhere from 40 to 60 mLs per hour. The body and the frontal horn cleared, but the temporal clot was persistent, and so the patient ended up having to go to the operating room for an endoscopic evacuation of that persistent temporal clot. And during the surgery, we were able to observe the uh, holes in the tip of the iroflow catheter uh, during the surgery, and you can see here, despite being placed directly in a thick intraventricular clot and being there for several days, all holes of the iroflow remain patent despite being um, directly adjacent to choroid plexus and again placed directly into a thick clot, showing the ability of the iroflow to drain IVH but not become occluded uh, and thus hopefully improving outcomes of patients and decreasing our risk of infection. And then finally, we're looking at this final case. This is an unfortunate patient who had a wound breakdown after craniectomy and developed complicated cerebritis uh, an abscess formation. So they were taken to the operating room to have the abscess drained, and then in the abscess uh, which bordered the ventricle, the iroflow was placed to wash that out. Despite the severity of the disease that you could see on the MRI previously, uh, we, using the iroflow, we were able to very rapidly clear the cerebral spinal fluid, and the uh, routine laboratory values based on the CSF, as you can see here, consistently improved to where um, the haziness and clarity of the CSF improved, as did the nucleated cell count. Ultimately, the patient made an excellent neurologic recovery with uh, resolution of the cerebritis and abscess formation despite having the abscess rupture into the ventricle, um, but unfortunately passed away related to a pulmonary embolism on postoperative day 18 after making a recovery from the infection and the neurologic sequela of that, showing the airflu's ability to treat even what would previously have been considered unsalvageable or um, near hopeless cases.